Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video and today's video is simply called This is All So Very Interesting. I couldn't come up with a more specific title for this because I am going to be discussing several things that have been brought to my attention, some things that I have just discovered on my own and some that has been brought to my attention through you viewers. So I always want to thank you because you do keep me on my toes and you bring to light so many things that I had no idea even existed. So I'm going to start out today's video with a comment that someone left on my blog that yes, has to do with the Civil War or at least a song having to do with the Civil War. But before I get into that, I found this as I was looking for Civil War photos. And I just, I always find these photos rather funny because they're supposedly in the middle of a battle. These are supposedly Civil War soldiers. And yet they're just lounging around, smoking a pipe, smoking pipes, not just one. Um, he's got the hidden hand going on. This dog is completely comfortable, so they certainly mustn't be close to any sort of battle because anyone who owns a dog knows that even with the slightest sound of thunder, most dogs will go running with their tail between their legs and hide like under a bed or under a table. But this dog is snoozing away and seems perfectly happy. But yes, this is supposedly taken during the Civil War. <laughs> anyway. I will say, though, that this entire video is not about the Civil War. I will be starting out talking about the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I will be dedicating a future video to the Civil War, but not this one. But I do have lots of thoughts on that. But let's go to that comment. And it says, Hi, Shelly. My husband and I love watching your YouTube videos. I found you because as a Christian, I started to wonder if we are actually in the little season and the thousand year reign of Jesus already is past. I was surprised to find that you too think that this may be a possibility. I was doing research on the battle hymn of the Republic when my husband, smart man, said that the words of the song make sense with the little season theory. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, for example, and the following verses also sure sound as though the woman who wrote it, Julia Ward Howe, had experienced God's reign upon the earth past tense. We've never heard anyone look into this or flush it out, so naturally we thought you would be perfect for this task if you choose to take it on. Thanks, J&J &J Warren. And I want to thank you for bringing this to my attention because I actually, I have heard the song, but I don't know the lyrics. And I know that probably makes me sound uncultured. So I was only too happy to dive into this and find out. And I knew that it said, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And I knew the glory, glory, hallelujah part. Didn't know the rest of it. Well, the rest of it in light of this comment is certainly very intriguing. So here we go. Mine eyes hath seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. And then we have the chorus, verse 2. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Then verse three. I have read a fiery gospel written burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my condemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. He is coming like the glory of the morning on the wave. He is wisdom to the mighty. He is honor to the brave. So the world shall be his footstool and the soul of wrong his slave. Our God is marching on. So I certainly see what you are talking about. Um, and I'm referring to the commenter here. It certainly does seem like Julia Ward Howe 
is writing a song as if she witnessed this with her own eyes. Um, especially if you read this part here, he has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul to answer him, be jubilant, my feet. And also this part here, mine eyes hath seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So it, this is like past tense. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Yeah, in light of the fact that there, so many of us are pretty sure that there was some sort of reset in the 19th century. And this song was also supposedly written in the 19th century, and it was written, it is said, about the Civil War. And we can actually read this here. So we'll just read a little bit about her. There's not a whole lot here. It's a stirring patriotic American song that dates back to the, to the American Civil War. Battle Hymn of the Republic was written by Julia Ward Howe after she was inspired by... Uh, the decidedly more gruesome John Brown's body, which she heard while visiting Union hospitals in 1861. So 1861, if we are going, if we're believing that year, I think that that does fit in well. There are many who believe that the reset may have happened sometime around 1850. And then 1890 is maybe the time when things started to get rolling again, which is why there are so many invention supposedly in 1890 so many towns built in 1890 so many churches and um, buildings supposedly built in 1890 and then of course we can't forget you know the census record fire in 1890 and the ellis island records being burned um i think about a year or two after the census records or maybe before but right around the same time we have the patent office also burned during that time we we have throughout the 19th century all of these great fires of all of these major cities through throughout the, uh, the United States. And then, yeah, we did have the Civil War too. So it fits in with that timeline, if you're to believe this. Full of biblical references and godly fury, the song has an interesting background with various influences, to say the least, and today remains a popular patriotic song in the United States. Um, and it doesn't really give much more information about it. So yeah, it said, again, that it was written about the Civil War, but I certainly see that she seems to be writing in the past tense as if she herself witnessed this. So, something to think about. And you know, while we're on the topic of song lyrics, when I was at church this past Sunday, we sang the song, the hymn, How Great Thou Art. And it never hit me before what the first verse says. It says, O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Yes, it says worlds. And yeah, this is something that I've been talking about recently. And let's not get triggered here. Worlds does not necessitate planets. It can mean dimensional. It can mean realms. Um, it can even mean different parts of, of the world that we live on now. It does not have to mean planets. I always have to point that out. And also it has even been translated as ages sometimes, which brings a, in a whole other dimension to it. But I'm, I'm wondering how many of you have noticed this song. And we know that, you know, worlds is in the Bible in many passages, plural worlds. Just one of those verses is Hebrews 11.3, where it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And yeah, it does say worlds. And as I mentioned, I believe it was in my last video, or maybe it would have been the one before that. A friend of mine looked it up um, in the original Greek that this was written in, and it it does use a plural version of the word. So, you know, that's something to, to think about also. It seems that people in centuries past 
they were much more open to this idea. We, we just seem to have this very, what, as Timothy Alberino calls it, anthropocentric viewpoint of, of the world. You know, we tend to think of us as being the center of everything. And, you know, and as in us, I mean, we, man, we humans. And the fact of the matter is we're not the center of everything. Christ is the center of everything. And so just because we are here in this realm doesn't have to mean that this is the only realm. Because again, I'm going to repeat it. We are not the center of everything. And I think that it's so hard for us as self-centered beings to get that in our heads. And just as with worlds, another word that you will see often used in the Bible is ages. And sometimes worlds and ages are used interchangeably and also sometimes universe. So all three of those. And I, another universe is another word that seems to trigger people because they think, oh, it means universe as shown on the Hubble telescope. No, universe just basically means what is up in the heavens. That's what universe is and everything, you know, that, that God created. It doesn't have to be what NASA is sending us computer CGI photos of. Okay. So let's just get that out there. But the King James Bible of Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And English Standard Version, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ages is something that is repeated all the time in the Bible. And I don't think that a lot of people actually think about what it could possibly mean. Um, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the English Standard Version says, Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And as you can see, there are many other versions that use ages, ages. King James says ends of the world on this one, ends of the ages, culmination of the ages. So again, yes, more than one age. And a lot of times we will think of ages as being what we know of in our historical record, but that doesn't mean that those are the only ages that there were. Again, we're going back to the self-centeredness that we think that everything revolves around us. And then I'm just going to share with you Colossians 1:26, where it says, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. I also found, I found the new American standard Bible um, translation of this neat. It says that is the mystery which had been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So yes, worlds is a definite theme that we will come across in the word as is the concept of ages ages past and ages to come. And so I think that is actually a nice segue into a comment that I'm going to be sharing with you next. So here we have a very well thought out comment and um, it's just refuting some of the things that I have talked about regarding the gap theory, which I know is a very controversial topic. So I'm going to read through this, this comment and then I am just going to give a little bit of a rebuttal. But what I want to point out, though, is that I am not claiming to be the be all and end all of information. I could always be wrong. And even when it comes to things like the gap theory and like um, the people of day six and all of these taboo topics that I that I bring up to you, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm 100 percent all in on them. What it means is that. I like looking into them. I like researching them. And I do want to know what the truth is. 
And actually, I, that brings to mind this verse here, which some friends of mine reminded me of, Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So I've had so many people commenting, telling me, oh, well, these, these things are distractions and we don't need to be looking into them because there's a reason that God isn't revealing them to us. But his word tells us it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And that is what I'm doing. I'm searching. I'm not coming up with any definitive conclusions, but I am searching. And I'm doing this with um, a pure heart because I, I just want to know the truth. And this says, <coughs> excuse me. I don't believe in the gap theory, and I have some compelling evidence for why. First, in Genesis, it says that God created the creatures of the sea and the birds that fly in the air and those that creep on the ground. Later, it says that God said, let us create man in our own image after our likeness. Note that in both of those verses, it says create, not recreate. That means that there could not have been pre-Adamites. I think that's very interesting. And again, I'm not saying that there were 100% pre-Adamites. I think that it's fun to look into. Um, and it does not take away from the gospel message. But I'm going to just talk about what your point is here that both the verses say create, not recreate. Um, now let's think of this. If I say that I am going to make a pizza, okay? It's something that I've done before, but I am not making the same pizza over and over again. If that were the case, I would say, okay, I'm going to remake this pizza right now. But even though I have made pizzas in the past, I am making different pizzas now. So I'm not remaking pizzas. I'm still making pizzas, even though I've done it before, if that makes any sense. And I'm, yeah, I'm using the word make instead of create. But I think that you get the idea. I think that when we are making something new, even if we've done something like it in the past, we don't necessarily have to use the word remake or recreate. So that is what I would have to say about that. So next in 2 Peter 3, 6 to 7, it talks about the fact that there was only one judgment the one of Noah's day. That would mean there would not be a judgment on pre-Adamites. Okay, so I have 2 Peter 3, verses 6 and 7 here, and it says, Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. And yes, it's certainly talking about Noah's flood. However, what I do not see here is it saying that there was only one other judgment. So I'm going to check some other versions and see if we can get something that might say that this was the only judgment. So we'll try English Standard Version. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So again, what I'm seeing here is that it is referring to the flood, but it is not saying that that was the only judgment. Um and we do know that there were other judgments that may not have been worldwide. You know, we have just Sodom and, Go Sodom and Gomorrah as an example. But yeah, it, it does not say that there was only one judgment um, at, up until and after the flood, until the coming judgment. It does not say that. And I would also have to say we need to remember that um, when they are writing within the confines of this age, if you think of it in terms of in terms of age. So if there were a pre-Adamic period, which I don't know, you know, if there were a, a gap period, as I've talked about many times, the gap that that seems to be there possibly between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, some sort of reset, so to speak, that would not be 
what we would consider to be the age that we are living in now. And so thus, it may not have been something that they even felt necessary to include. Um, finally, in Peter, it says, but they forgot the deluge of Noah's day. If there was a pre-Adamite judgment, then Peter would have most certainly mentioned it. And I think I just went over that, that if there were a pre-Adamite judgment, they may not have necessarily found it necessary. I just said necessary like three times in one sentence. But <laughs> this is something written in the from day one on in this age here. But again, I do have to point out that there were other judgments. It's just that Noah's judgment, well, not specifically Noah's, but the biblical flood was recent enough that people would remember it. Maybe not personally, obviously, but it was still something that was within, you know, their, their collective memories. And it's something that they would all have understood the references to. So anyway, I don't believe that people will go to hell because they believe in the gap theory. I believe that if you trust in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, then you will be saved. Amen. That's what's most important. Amen. But I also think that if you believe in the gap theory, then it questions the truth of the Bible. And see, on that, I would have to say that I, I disagree with that just because I don't see anything in the Bible that says that it would not be possible. I have not seen anything that would convince me of that. I think a lot of that is just what we have grown up learning in the church. We, we look at things from the uh, church perspective, or we look at things through a Christian worldview instead of looking at things through a biblical worldview, because sometimes, unfortunately, Christian tradition is not always biblical tradition. We Christians have one view of the world, especially the modern world that we're living in today, whereas the people who wrote the, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, they had a much different worldview than what we have. So many times the, the interpretations that we assign to things, we're looking at through our modern eyes and we're not looking at them through the perspectives of what the ancient Hebrews thought. So I think that's important too. Anyway, we really enjoy your videos. Thanks for helping us think critically. And I want to thank you so much for leaving this comment because I really did enjoy um, going over this. Because, you know, we need to be able to talk about stuff like this and not get angry with one another and not ridicule one another. Because again, I don't feel one way or the other about it yet. But I think that it's important that we do come at it from both sides, which is really how we should approach everything. We should always weigh the evidence on both sides of things. The last thing that I wanted to share with you today does have to do with the people of day six. And I know I've talked about this multiple times. And every time that I think I'm done talking about it, something new pops up. And this actually happened to me also this past Sunday during the sermon. Our pastor was going over Genesis 48. And at the one po point of it, when he was talking about it, a light went on. And I'll get to that in a minute. But for those of you who may be watching, who don't know what I'm talking about when I say people of day six, there are what some people believe to be two separate creation stories in the book of Genesis. So the one Genesis one verses 26 to 27 says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. Okay. So now if we look at this one, mankind was created after everything else was created. And it seems that they were created in multiples. So God created mankind in his, in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. It seems that they were created as a group after everything else was created. Now we have in Genesis 2, um, verse 18 and 20 to 24, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God then created animals, 
But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So if you look at the Genesis 2 account, I will say that it doesn't give the whole thing, and I wish this actually, this graphic would have given more, because it seems in this one that Adam was created first here. He was created before there were any plants. He was created before the animals, and he was placed in a garden. So here, man was created. It seems in multiples last. And here, Adam was placed in a garden first. So that's that's something, you know, that that's one reason that I think it's a possibility that there are two separate creation accounts. Just because it seems that the... The, the chronology of the whole thing seems to be off. Now, one of the rebuttals to the idea that there was a separate creation from Adam and Eve is that we are told in the New Testament that Adam was the first man. And so, yes, that would seem like a slam dunk. Okay. He was the first man. There were no other um, people created on what we would say our day six, day six creation, because it says right here that Adam is the first man. But something that my pastor actually brought up in Genesis 48 and what he actually pointed out really yeah, it, it kind of gives me the idea that this, it's very possible could be the case here. So in Genesis 48, it was just talking about when Israel blessed Joseph's sons, um, Manasseh and Ephraim. And when he was doing it, um, let's just read here. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons, whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face, and behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And the reason he did it this way was because Manasseh was the older son, so he wanted him to be at Israel's right hand, and Ephraim was the younger son, so he wanted him at Israel's left hand. But it says here, and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands. For Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph and said. So when he did this blessing to Manasseh and Ephraim, what he did was he symbolically assigned the um, status of firstborn to Ephraim instead of to Manasseh. And this is something that happens in the Bible sometimes, that there are times when firstborn status is given to someone who is not actually the firstborn. Another example of that would be Abraham with Ishmael and Isaac. He has given firstborn status to Isaac when Ishmael was his firstborn son. So the reason for this is because God has a special purpose for the ones who, who are given firstborn status. And so as, as my pastor was talking about this, I was just thinking, could that be what has happened with Adam being called the first man? Just as people love to um, comment that Eve was called the mother of all living. And I always say, well, 
Eve wasn't the mother of all living because she was not the mother of Adam. So if you want to look at it that way, you know, to me, it means that she had a special status. She was assigned a special status as the mother of all living, even if technically she was not the mother of all living simply because she wasn't the mother of Adam. And is this actually what has happened with Adam? Is it possible that he is called the first man because he was assigned special status? He was specifically created to not only tend the Garden of Eden separate from the people outside of the garden. He was created specifically to tend the Garden of Eden. And more importantly, he was created specifically to begin the line of Christ, to, to be Christ's ancestor. That is where the lineage of Christ came from. He descended from Adam. So if we're looking at it that way, and many people believe that the Bible is specifically written for those who are of the lineage of Adam. And that's actually something that I had never heard of before. I didn't even know that that thought process existed. But it's just a question that I have now. Is the, the, the status of first man symbolic or is it literal? I don't know. Anyway, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.